Dear Mama, if you're feeling like you're in quicksand, disconnected, or just running on empty, then this is the episode for you. It is a reminder to not limit spirit, that spirit is in everything and we must see it and act like it's in everything and we must continue to dig deeper for a higher connection. In this episode, we revisit episode four, How I Made It Over, recorded two years ago and evaluate our spiritual evolution since then. This is an Empty the Crates episode, meaning we recorded it a while back around early spring and never released it. So some of the commentary may be a little bit dated, but it's a real gem, y'all. While I was editing, I felt like, wow, I really, really needed to hear this. So listen and ask yourself, what do I need to be rooted in to gain alignment on all levels of my being in every aspect of my identity to manifest the life I need and want for me and my children to thrive. And let us know what your answer is, or even if you couldn't come up with an answer, send us your thoughts and questions about the episode. As always, thanks for rocking with us. Don't just listen, subscribe, and follow us on all social media platforms at Dim Black Mamas Podcast so you won't miss an episode. Please keep emailing us, keep engaging with us through social media comments, your reviews, and SoundCloud comments. Keep sharing us, even if it's only with one other person. If you're a new listener, welcome to the ride. Invest in us by becoming a DBM patron, buying merchandise, or even giving a one-time donation. For all show notes, check our website, dimblackmamas.com. And now let's get free y'all and jump into episode 27 of Dim Black Mamas. to the ride. It's another episode of Dim Black Mamas. I'm Crystal Snell Irby, mother of four, three boys and one girl. And I'm Thea Monier, mother of three girls. And I'm Nikisha Killings, also mother of three girls. So um, we have a great episode this time. Of course, we're going to start out with our church announcements and prayer <laughs> list requests. And let me tell you people. A lot of folks on this prayer list. I, no, I like I'm on the prayer list and we'll get to that later. Okay. And then we're going to jump into our Mac and cheese segment. Yes. So yes. Which is really exciting because I love when we do this. We're revisiting an episode. We're revisiting episode four, uh, How I Made It Over. Mm-hmm. Mm. how I made it over over and that was an episode about spirituality and so we're going to talk about where we were then as opposed to where we are now so if you want to stop this recording right now and go back and listen to episode four and then listen to this episode or if you're like oh I gotta go back and listen to episode four you know to get the gist of what they're talking about then we really really welcome you to do that followed by an awesome collection plate cause and then as always we end with black mama say Mm -hmm. so that's our outline for this episode so let's just jump right on in because let me tell you i need this moment okay here we go (laughs) here we go beloveds beloveds Beloved. She is here. Put your church baba on the list. Mm. <laughs> here are this episode's church announcements and prayer list requests. And do not take these prayer list requests lightly. <laughs> we really <laughs> need these prayers. <laughs> need these prayers. And we need you to go to the Honey. upper room, wherever it may the be in your house. <laughs> need you in the upper room the upper room but not the lower room not the lower room not the middle the room <laughs> not the middle room the, the shekinah room. the shekinah glory. all that so our first church announcement is that uh, announcement is that we got our patreon page up and yes. running pay and the ladies 
and we want, yes, yes, invest, <laughs> invest. And we want to give a shout out to our first patron. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Ooh. Michelle. Who else could it be? Who, Who else would it be? But Alicia Michelle. Yes, number one fan, honey. Number one fan. So she is our first patron and we want to give her a special, special shout out on the podcast. So the link to our Patreon is in the bio of every social media site that we have. So please go there and invest in us because when you invest in them, Black Mamas, you're investing in more than a podcast. You are investing in three women who yeah. are committed to and actively, and I mean actively creating spaces of creativity mm. and healing yes. for Black people. And yeah. so that's what you're investing in when you become a patron. I do have another church announcement. I want to say that I have officially been tried in the doula fire. <laughs> and so this is a church announcement and a prayer list request. Yeah. And okay. my clients did give me permission to share a bit about their stories. When I went through my training, my trainer took us through every single scenario. And I was sitting in the training like, okay, I get it. But I just know, you know, on my first couple of times, mm -hmm. mine ain't going to be extreme like this. Because, you know, God just ain't gonna work like that well clearly I'm not up to date on my relationship with God because God worked like that God worked like that for you God was like okay so you say you want to be a doula so here we go I have dealt with child protective services I have dealt with uh, services for refugees so one of my clients gave birth to a first generation American and I am so grateful to say, and I, I do not say this lightly, because when you're in that room, it's touch and go. Yeah, you realize that I am standing in the midst of life yeah. and death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I do not take it lightly when I say I am grateful and overjoyed that all three of the children are alive, mm -hmm. and that all three of the mothers yes. are alive. I'm, I'm like about to start crying, but it has been a I don't know the word for it, but I've never done grassroots work like this before. Mm. It is really, really grassroots yeah. work. You are watching systemic and institutional oppression, like the embodiment of it, yeah. not yeah. just in the medical system, but in the people yeah. within yeah. that system and also in your client. Yeah. Yeah. When you engage your client and you see how disconnected we are from our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so it's also been a very healing experience for me. And I know the direction that I do want to go in with this work now. Eventually what I want to do with this work is go into policy mm -hmm. because that's really where the breakdown is. There is no policy around it or there's policy around it that is just not conducive to a birthing experience. Right. put me on the prayer list as that work continues. But my prayer list request is I was sick for like a week, which really, really threw me off. In the midst of me being sick, our washing machine and dryer gave out. And let me tell you, that'll stop all function. It will. That can end a relationship and <laughs> it can also make you contemplate the number of children that you have. And then our refrigerator is on the mm -hmm. brink. So we have to do all these tricks and stuff to keep our refrigerator like, oh, going. That is a shout it's out to the Patreon. We can't let a black mama and a black family go on with the refrigerator that keeps things lukewarm. It gives a lot to y'all. Y'all can help oh. her get the fridge. So, you know, we got the wash and dryer delivered. There was a dramatic delivery. Well, that sound like one of your births. It was a dramatic yeah, it does. delivery. It, it was. When I tell you the one thing you cannot do with black people is put them in the middle of something like the delivery people, the deliveries were getting messed up. And so people were blaming them. No. And so the delivery people start spilling all the tea on the company and mm -hmm. what's going on in the company. You know, people missing business with pleasure and not doing their job. And it's like, you know, I just really don't want to know. I like, Can I just get my refrigerator? Mm -hmm. And so just put me on the prayer list that they deliver the refrigerator within the week. I mean, but you know, he had to spill it there in a safe space, Crystal, because <laughs> switch when he went back to work and act like right. everything was all good. He I feel really like that person tried to keep in that moment. He could keep a job. That's it. You know what I'm saying? So he was like, let me get this shit off my chest. <laughs> so I can go back and do with these old fucking crackers. You know all they think. So he was just <laughs> trying to keep his job. And he just wants you to know it wasn't his fault. I say that because there's times I walked out the door and just as the first thing I saw, I'm like, let me tell you about this. <laughs> That's how it was. 
I mean, he was just trying to keep a job. I mean, I don't know. What yeah, to I can relate to him. He was like, they've been messing up all day. And then, you know, we get out here, right? Trying to deliver stuff and it's not right. And then, you know, the customer blame us. And I right. understand that the customer should be satisfied. But what about my well-being? Are they going to pay me to be out here to 12 o'clock at night delivering? <laughs> like, it was a long... Black people are natural <laughs> entrepreneurs. It's true. <laughs> We will always rebel against you making us work a nine to five in any way, shape, or form. If you hire us, this is just what comes with the territory, okay? Because you know, at the end of the day, he's thinking, I shouldn't even have to work for these folks. It's true. <laughs> you know, I could be running my own thing. I could be like, oh I my could be God, my house. let's tap into it. Because you know what he said when he was on the phone with the supervisor? He said, you know, this ain't my first rodeo. This ain't the first company that I done delivered stuff for. So I know how it's supposed to go. You're so right you're so right you're so right he should have his own delivery company we are not meant to work for you know what he went wrong he gave him the whole eight he gave him the whole eight that day. and that is why he's, he's mad, mad about it right <laughs> you know they didn't deserve it if he took an hour that morning to work on his own Boom. delivery business just work on the logo that's it you know what i'm saying <laughs> Call a couple of his boys. Make sure they down to be on the right. team. Whatever. He would have felt a lot better by the time he got to your house. He would have. You know what he would have been thinking? I'm almost out this bitch. That's it. <laughs> I don't care what they doing in the back office. I'm going to steal their deliveries. You know what a real one will do? You know what a real one will do? Hand you his business card for his first Next time. Business. Next time, holla at your boy. <laughs> While I'm doing the delivery yeah. for the company. Yeah. If you need anything else, let me know. I hope this brother listening so we can give him <sighs> these tips. Brother, if you're listening, print up your business card. Okay, next time they fuck up the deliveries, don't even say, say you know, this is this is unprofessional. I can't believe this dude. You know who would never do this to you? Johnson & Johnson uh, <laughs> delivery. We would never do that. Oh, gosh. We show up five minutes early. Oh, God. That's so spot on. I just want to hold space for that, brother. I just want to hold space. <laughs> It's hard. We're not meant to do this. Okay. So please put me on the prayer list. <laughs> put that brother on the prayer list, too. Yes. And send him epi- what episode is Black Mama Creative. Send him that episode. <laughs> yeah. So those are my church announcements and prayer list requests. Yes. Okay. And teach you under yours. So for me, I would just like the people to go ahead and pour one out. Holla at your big homie in the sky. Whatever. Pour, pour one out. <laughs> That is some Florida shit. That is some Florida. What? That is where there are times when Florida and LA remind me of each other. And that, it's that kind That's of That's one of those times. That is one of those times. I mean, they know what I'm talking about. I know they know. I'm not denying that they do, Nikisha. <laughs> I'm just pointing out that, that there's some kind of Black connection there with the Florida and California folk. I don't know exactly what it is. You know, we, we it's, it's the water. It's, it's the maybe water it and, and maybe it's the tropical weather. I, I, it's something it's like that. Water. It, but yeah, pour one out, your big homie in the so sky. That's a rap song. Go ahead. <laughs> That is it. That is somebody on the West Coast trying to be a rapper right now. Write that down. Somebody did. Somebody from Dane County wants to have a career. Write that. Write that down. Do all of that for your girl. Uh, I don't think I have a specific prayer request. It's just general to me. Um, I think you know. Last time I revealed that I am expecting number four. Yeah. Um, Yeah. This journey has been unlike any of the others and it will continue to be and I think I would really love for just some positivity some warm thoughts some prayer some goodness around making sure that all the pieces come together for this to be a really positive Mm -hmm. um, Mm birth experience Uh, I believe this is my last one I thought the last one was too but I believe this is my last one and I really like this 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 is the last one we're gonna have to have we're gonna have to have an ongoing prayer intercession (laughs) We're going to have to retire listen, from the podcast so that listen. we can wear sackcloth and cover our heads and wail full time. I will be the main if one. Is, if, I will be the if main there, one. If there is one more Wait, coming down the pike, God bless the children, but it's going to take all of the saints <laughs> to keep it together. She's not wrong. I'm not wrong. I already know. I'm on call. I already know my time is coming up. I got to get all my shit together now. <laughs> Cause I'm the closest damn black mama. You need to pack your bag. I gotta got my. I gotta have a go bag. I gotta have shit together. Listen, I don't know. How it's real problem. up in here. It's and real. Yeah, has really been on a journey to put together a situation where she can have you know control and say so in the birth. So much so that Nikisha was willing to do. <laughs> oh. I have to 
a back alley birth. <sighs> Let me tell you how serious the black maternal health crisis is. Let me tell you, it's, it's a real thing. We have women out here who feel so powerless <laughs> in their birth experience that they are willing to do a home birth with a doctor <laughs> who is no longer board certified. We won't say why. We'll just say it could have been a lifetime movie. No, we'll say that it's still in the making of a lifetime. It like, could still it- possibly be a lifetime movie. Listen. This is the point that we have got to. This is why we have to turn the tide of Black maternal health. And God bless Nikisha because she has done her due diligence. I think she met with 25 (laughs) doulas and 18 (laughs) midwives and 32 OBs. And she has toured a hospital. I I feel like that is true. I don't know if those numbers are exactly accurate, but it feels right at this point. I'm tired as hell. I've been all around town. And that's what it feels like and in the tax credit. I'm a Scorpio. So you have to keep in mind that that is a tireless process <laughs> for a Scorpio to go through because they don't even fuck with that many people to begin this is, with. This is true. Yes. This is true. Let me tell you. I, I, one day I will share the whole saga, but just know it has been a saga. Yes, there was a the potential of an OB who no longer has privileges in any hospital but will come to my living room and help me have the baby here. And then will disappear if I need to go to the hospital because he can't go to the hospital. That's, that's the thing. But she listed the options and that was the option. I was confused as to <laughs> how we were in the position where this person was as listed as an he option. He was on a list. He was on a list of things that I had on the table of the options. Yes. 95% of the time we talk through our text thread, but when shit gets serious, we call each other. Yeah. And... <laughs> I didn't even respond in the text. I was like, nah, I got to call her. Because this is where we are, people. Back alley births. This is where we are. Okay? If you're a longtime listener, you know that I have had cesareans. That is why I'm in this yes. position. No hospital wants to touch mama who cut this many times. And midwives are like, ooh, mm, not sure about that either. So it's a whole thing to actually find care that's competent and compassionate. And so enter random doctors who do home births may or may not have licenses any longer or privileges but you found a dope doula i found a dope doula after many i interviewed a lot of after folks. many she's on it she's the one now i like her someone who referred me to her was like now she's not bubbly she's not super like sweet and over the top and i was like bitch i'm not gonna be bubbly in the process either no please no i need her to be on point really grounded yeah and i need her to be able to anticipate my needs know that i am high strong high needs and she needs to be right there and not everybody can handle that a couple of dudes like oh i have a quick question for tia maybe Hmm. you can answer this what's beyond high strong (laughs) neurotic (laughs) (laughs) neurotic and with this type of pregnancy it could flip into psychotic i know who i am (laughs) we can make the flip we can make the flip i'm okay with that her doula's job is to keep her in the neurotic high strong area and prevent actual psychosis <laughs> and, and I you could do it I like I like this it's person, a big job though. I really like I'm, I'm paying you know I'm willing to pay for it I know <laughs> this you, level of care <laughs> I'm, willing to pay for it. I'm really just gonna be the backup doodle because I feel like this doodle got it under control I'm gonna be like the nervous system like keeping the other people calm keeping people informed on the outside and let the doula and Nikisha have her space I will give you a sign I will give you more assigned duties as we get closer <laughs> Oh my goodness, it just got me off. Is that not my job? Okay. <laughs> what I know for sure is my contract says the doula will be there until about, you know, one to two hours after baby arrives. Then I need some, I need my shirt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then I then can get the gear. But keep me on the prayer list. Keep me lifted up, y'all. Sounds like you need to keep my co-host lifted up for the support they're going to provide after baby comes. Lift them up yes. as well. <laughs> All of us. Love lifts us up. I promise not to have a back alley birth. I promise not to do that. But I don't know where it's going from here. Um, Before we jump into our uh, mac and cheese segment, I just want to say make sure you are subscribed wherever you listen. So wherever you're listening, please don't just listen there. Please make sure that you are subscribed. We are everywhere that podcasts are available except uh, Pandora. Uh, And we're going to be on Pandora soon. And make sure you follow us on social media. We're at Dim Black Mamas everywhere. And don't just follow us or like us. Engage with us. We want to hear back from you. I love when people engage with us. We really, really want you to engage with us because it's it's really about engagement and connection with us. So now we can transition 
into, into mac and cheese. We're so excited about this mac and cheese. Extremely segment. excited. Like we said, we went back and we re-listened to How I Made It Over. It's episode four. Mm-hmm. And that was an episode where we all happened to be in the same place. That was the one time I think. We That's the only time it's ever happened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In this hotel room. And Crystal and I had done a presentation the day before at an event at Cal State LA that turned out to be really beautiful and uplifting and fed us all. And I remember Nikisha came in with a, with this amazing head wrap. I just remember that. And so it, she was like a goddess. Nikisha's head wraps are like origami. But anyway, yeah. so I think what I love most about this episode when we reviewed it was it was so unexpected. We were so open yeah. from the day before. I don't even remember what our original topic was going to Education. Be. We were supposed and, to talk about education. And it, well, we did not. Like yeah. we talked about so many other things and it was kind of like my coming out of uh, to talk about being, you know, a black woman who practices Ifa. And so we're going to really get to explore our own growth in this episode about how Ooh. we've grown the things that surprises from that episode to now when we re-listened if you get a chance to re-listen please do so my question to my co-host would be what was your biggest aha moment or revelation from the episode so actually mine came before we got into what we now call the mac and cheese segment we talked quite a bit you all helped supported me through kind of thinking through some challenges I was having with relationships around me and how I was really attracting people who were drains on my energy mm, and my mm. peace um, and helping me to really come to a, to a place where I knew what my options were in terms of dealing with those folks instead of allowing them to continue to drain me and be so exhausting. Um, and I appreciate it. We had some really rich discussion around being semi-permeable mm-hmm. membrane, as uh, Thea called it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah. in my- Yes. <laughs> yes and choosing who and when to let folks in and, and creating mm. healthy boundaries mm. and making sure that I didn't just mm. avail myself make myself so available to all the folks mm. who needed to dump 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 and drain 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 um, and that to me was really powerful and it was spiritual to me as much as the rest of the conversation where we got into our new involving belief systems that we were coming into so mm. I wanted to shout out and thank you all for that oh I remember that yes yes I use that a lot. Uh, my aha moment is I realized we didn't know how powerful we were. Mm. There were a lot of things that we were talking about that I don't think at the time we understood that we were speaking things into existence. Absolutely. And then to see things that have manifested since that episode was like, we are so powerful. Okay, so for example, if you were talking about Oya, Mm-hmm. In episode four, mm-hmm. you were talking about being rooted in joy. Mm-hmm. I was talking about being rooted in healing mm-hmm. my body because of my birth story. Mm-hmm. Then I hadn't yet decided to become a doula. Mm-mm. Then I hadn't had my fibroid surgery. I was about to say, you hadn't even had your surgery. I hadn't even had right. my surgery yet. Right. And I know at that point was never going to have a surgery. Mm. Then you had not even talked about the Underground Railroad Mm -hmm. and accessing joy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even on your radar to get a certification in sex therapy. therapy. Nikisha was talking about um, how we rape the earth and rob the earth when it comes to food and our bodies. And now to see your journey in terms of your relationship with food and Mm -hmm. how you eat. That's a good one. We were speaking these things. Yes. 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 Right? We had no idea what we were manifesting by simply speaking those things out loud. I went back and I have an intention box and I wrote down eight intentions after I had my fibroid surgery. I put them on a little piece of paper, wrote them down, put them in the box. It's sitting on my altar. I look at it maybe every three to four months when I'm feeling a little uh, like I'm in quicksand, I look at it and I pull those intentions out after I, I listen to episode four again, I've manifested five out wow. of eight of those intentions. Wow. And all eight of those intentions I spoke about or had had some connection yeah. to that episode. Mm. That was the aha for me is like, we don't realize how powerful yeah. we are by simply speaking things, by simply speaking it, we begin the connection with the spiritual world and that begins the connection of 
manifestation. Yeah. It, it, you know, I was texting exactly. you guys the whole yeah. time. Like, it was amazing. It was amazing. It, that, I had the same aha moment. Mine, mine was very much around the power of manifestation, but also that we know what we know. Mm-hmm. When we say that we came here with everything we need to know to be successful and to reach our destiny in this mm-hmm. lifetime, it's absolutely true. That episode also was a lot about our hindrances. Yes. Mm-hmm. What have been the barrier? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the social shaming around being Afro-spiritualist, right? Never being introduced to terms like eco-womanism, never being mm-hmm. exposed to things about food consciousness, right? And so those barriers are in the way between us and what we know, but what we know is already there. And so mm-hmm. we've heard it a million, a million times. A million as, a man, times. as a man thinketh, so he, so he is. We've heard it through every text a million times, but actually Hours the time. this is also the importance of documenting yourself, right? Like whether it's through video or audio or writing things down, because I guarantee you, if you start to document yourself every year, when you look back, you'll see that you did more than you give yourself credit for. And this allowed us yeah. to give ourselves credit for the work we have been doing. Now I'm working on something that I spoke about less than a year ago. Mm. And when it came back around, I realized, oh, my spirit was preparing me a year yeah. ago mm-hmm. for the thing and gave me the, the next piece right now. And so really being conscious that you know what you know and that your life is set up to reveal these things to you. But you have to be open. You have to have a practice, a spiritual practice, a food practice, a body practice, a social circle that really supports revelation Mm -hmm. for manifestation and the unearthing of these things in you. Like I probably would have said the word healing a couple years ago. Healing is still my word, but also how to heal has become evident to me now. So I knew healing was my word, but now I didn't know that joy was going to be the pathway Mm -hmm. that I used to that healing and that decolonization and pleasure and all these things would be connected to that idea. And I was, this about the Oya piece. Oh, so, you know, I get emotional. Okay, so just a little backstory. So in the episode, Pia is just beginning the practice of Ifa, but I'm not sure if you had gone to a temple yet or anything like that. But she was learning about the Orishas and Orishas are angelic spirits that watch over us. Mm. Okay. So she said last year, I was seeing so much Oya stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about who Oya is? Yeah. The Orishas are like different, I would say representatives of God. Mm -hmm. So same way we think of angels. That's that's why angels was a a spiritual force, the spiritual force, and they govern different aspects of our life. And so Oya, from the first time I heard her name, something about her really registered with me, but people were scared of her because in the West, again, we've been conditioned to think of it a certain way. And she's highly associated with death, which actually in Nigeria, she's not, she's associated with the Niger river. She's associated with air and she's associated with the marketplace and transformation, but she's also a warrior. She's not considered nothing to play with. You know, you got to approach her with some respect, put some respect on her chest. You know what I'm saying? I think what people get wrong is they associate dismantling or destruction with death. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, it's It's transformation. Transformation. Transformation is a much, much more accurate word to describe what she does. And and nothing happens without that force, that raw energy that converts things. You have to be very wise, loving, compassionate, shrewd, brilliant. To this, is how I, be. this is how I know that that's not my spiritual. <laughs> to, be, to be in that position. The thing I want to connect is that for some reason, her name resonated with me. She was the first Arisha that gave me any form of vision or spiritual contact that I know of, that I'm conscious of. So through my journey, I wasn't sure like who my Orisha was, but I always longed for her. I always hoped it would be her. And so when I did my one hand ceremony last year, I remember the day before telling my friend and teacher Maida, I said, what if it's Oya? And I remember when Baba did the cast and the moment he said her name, it was just like, yes. Like I was like, yeah. so thrilled. Cause I knew I was hers and you knew it. Before, well, and also, I want you to tell us about what a one, one hand is. Yeah. But you knew it before you even really yeah. began I knew it in my practice. Cells. That was the thing for me that, that I was like, when we are really rooted, yeah. yeah. when we really trust that root and that yeah. intention when we're rooted from a clear space, because you can be rooted in all kinds yeah. of things. You can be yeah. rooted in your ego. Yeah. You can be rooted in money. But when you're really rooted in something, 
real and raw yeah you know because like you said in that episode we sound so unsure yeah. there are yeah. all these hindrances yeah. and all this yeah. other stuff well, that's how we sound in the moment but then when we go back and listen it's like we knew it on we yeah. knew yeah. right, right i was we speaking knew. the answers yeah. i think we were at the verge of beginning to explore what i now consider to be our ancestral spiritual technology there we go that's taking the place of then by permeable membrane um, our ancestral membrane. spiritual technology hold on hold on whenever we have new theory on the show i got a new thing that i do <laughs> pause for the cause people this is new theory. New theory here. alert. Okay. New theory alert. New theory alert. But it's honestly, it's not new. Mm, Me going mm, through. Okay. Mm, mm. No. We have the power we have the to power. manifest. There you go. Absolutely. Because I ain't never heard nobody say, Keisha, you ever heard anybody say ancestral, ancestral spiritual once. technology? Okay. But you're right. Oh, girl, we got an acronym. AST. Okay. There we go. And we always say that. I asked for it. <laughs> We've already been using that term. Tell the people what it is. Tell the people. I'm telling y'all, you know what you know. That wasn't anybody. You just said somebody that free was, today, girl. You just so said spiritual. somebody free. Oh. Dun, dun. Oh. Start shouting. So okay, I'm trying to focus because this episode did so much for us. On one hand is a ritual where you essentially tie yourself to Ifa. And Ifa is the wisdom of God. So you're saying you commit to being a follower of the wisdom of God. When I tell you all, and I'm going to stay focused, okay. when I tell you all, this was the most beautiful thing anyone has ever done for me in my life. It was about me. It was about my gifts. It was dedicated to me. I was thought about. I was prayed over. I was meditated on long before I walked into the space. You could only know how to create that for me by sitting in deep mm -hmm. meditation and accessing some form of spiritual technology yeah. that I was like, oh, I need to understand and learn this because it was cellular. There was so much joy. And I really feel like that ceremony shifted me wow. to a joy perspective. All my work from that moment, partly it's because that was such a theme in the ritual itself and how he created it. When I say ancestral spiritual technology, what I'm saying is that I, it was very clear to me why they would not want us to know this about ourselves or feel uh -huh. this way or have access to tools that opened up this part of ourselves that said, you are so worthy and valuable yeah. to this space that we have put so much time and energy and love and thought and meditation and prayer and ritual and herbs and water and everything into this because yeah. of you, yeah. this one individual. We believe in your destiny and we love it so mm -hmm. much that we are all here to make sure that this thing comes forth. Understand people, this was our normal. If we were using that level of spiritual knowledge and technology as our normal every day, mm -hmm. I believe there was nothing metaphysically that we were not doing, mm -hmm. that we really fully understood how spiritual law and physical law interact with each other and how spiritual law and mental law can bend and move things in the physical world. Jesus talked about faith, which is metaphysical, the size of a mustard seed moving a mountain, which is a physical thing. We knew how to access these things in that moment. Yeah. And then to know I am hers, I am Oyaz, who is over this transformation, who brings these two worlds together for the sake of removing the dead things. I have not walked or thought the same mm. since. And the gift of it, I think that's what I strive to share in my work. Whether or not people decide they want to practice Ifa, I want them to have access to this gift. That's how my work has changed. Like I'm trying to figure out how to gift this freedom to others. That's a beautiful thing. It is. I was wondering if you could tell the people, what does it mean to be Oyas? You said you, you were so elated to know that mm. you were hers. So, and everything in Ifa is relational and informational. It's really about, you know, less about good, bad, and more about here's information. Mm -hmm. You know, the technology accesses information through the wisdom of God. And all the information is about is, are you in alignment with your destiny or aren't you? So it's all about alignment and relationships. So you have actual relationships with these energies. Just like you have your physical world, friend relationships and family relationships, you have a spiritual world relationship. So to be Oya, what my goal is, is to become a sh living shrine mm -hmm. for the energy of Oya to rest and work through. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you really become that energy, a force of change, a force of transformation. That's the walk and that's the commitment. Yeah. I just want to break down some things for the saints right here are getting a little anxious. They are. <laughs> right here in this episode. 
So when, when Thea talks about her one hand ceremony, I think sometimes when we think about Afro spirituality, we have this dark image of something negative and underworld. That's by going design. On. Right. Mm-hmm. And even now when people talk about Afro spirituality, I think more people are writing articles on it because a lot of black women are beginning to practice it. They're, they're still Witch- naming it witchcraft, mm-hmm. which is problematic because if you know anything about Ifa, mm-hmm. Ifa does not live or thrive or want you to go into the occult or the dark right. world. Right. Right. Ifa wants you to be a light force mm-hmm. in the world. Mm-hmm. So when she's talking about her ceremony, I know sometimes you know we can get a little, just a little antsy and a little, you know, we, a little pushback. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. we, we're colonized. Let me tell you how colonized we are. Mm-hmm. Baptism, right, is a ritual. Is a ritual. You get dressed. There's a choir singing. Mm-hmm. They recite scripture. They mm-hmm. pray over you. Mm-hmm. You've had classes and information about the faith that you're supposed to practice, mm-hmm. which is based on a virgin getting pregnant by an angel <laughs> and having the son of Break God. It down. Break it down. I'm not saying it's not true. But what I'm saying is, if we can believe that, if we can believe that and then have a practice that confirms it, Mm -hmm. that when you are dumped down in water, not one time, not two times, but three times because Mm -hmm. father, son, Mm -hmm. and we believe that there's an angelic spirit watching over us called who? The The Holy Holy Ghost. Which can fill you, which means you are also a shrine for that Holy Ghost. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. See how much I went to vacation Bible school? It pays Mm -hmm. off. I mean, you never forget it. So you're dumped in the water three times and you come up and what happens? Your mind is renewed. You Mm -hmm. are supposed to walk and talk and have a different Mm -hmm. intention and life because salvation is an instant. Sanctification is a lifetime commitment that is a renewing of the mind because your heart has changed and it's a renewing of the mind. And if you want to rewind Mm -hmm. this and listen back to what Thea just said, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how is that any different? So the fear that we have is a reflection of the colonization. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you that the fear was there because if you know it, Mm -hmm. if you know what you really have access to in terms of this ancestral spiritual technology, if you know that you have a village of people who are praying for your destiny to be Mm -hmm. fulfilled, you will act different. You will walk free. Mm -hmm. You will be decolonizing yourself actively. For those who are are interested in getting into this in a little bit more academic way, I want to recommend the book, African American Religions, 1500 to 2000. Mm -hmm. Um, by Sylvester Johnson. I just flipped the book open as we were talking because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to say something that was mm-hmm. incorrect. And it flipped directly to a page that talked about Africans who arrived in the low country, which was Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina mm-hmm. around the 1700s and 1800s. And it talked about many of them had been converted to Catholicism back in Africa before they came. So there's a strong Catholic kind of strain running through the people anyway, but they never let go of their original ancestral practices mm-hmm. either. Mm-hmm. The whole page talks about how important water was to them and nature mm-hmm. And connecting to water, mm-hmm. and that even in their enslaved states, they treated fishing, hunting, nurturing produce mm-hmm. from the soil as a spiritual kinship practice because they were holding yeah. on to what they what they knew was right in terms of connecting with the earth. Yeah. Even though there was some Catholicism forced upon them, they still yeah. held on to their ritual. And you see yeah. it today in the Black Church. We do some stuff the White yeah. Church don't do, right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> we do a bunch right, of stuff right. that we have just held on to because we knew it was right. And it's, if you think about it, it's the stuff that makes us feel most connected. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Dancing, oh, the yes, music. Yes. These are the things yes. that lifts us to a higher realm. That if we go sit in the average white church and we're just like, what the hell? Girl. There's no connection. Where's the spirit? And that ties into what Crystal was saying earlier because the thing you realize with Afro spirituality is that it reintegrates. And this is the, yes. this ties into eco womanism yes. as well. Eco womanism recognizes the human world, the living world, the non-living environment, and the spirit world as one super organism and recognizes that human beings have injured that. And so the idea of healing that comes through the re-spiritualization of practices. Yes. So reintegrating spirit into everything we do. So what colonization did was take spirit out of 
our everyday existence, our food, our water, our family, our our rituals, our into everything about our bodies, our home. And it said to access spirit, you have to come to this particular place that we own and we control. Mm -hmm. And so what Afro spirituality does is re-spiritualizes the world around you. And when you see the spirit of God in everything, how can you not change how you interact with yourself and the world. The thing that I realized in listening to the episode is in ter- when, you're, when you're talking about religion and the colonization and, and it doesn't allow us to see God in everything is that we live in a culture that doesn't cultivate intimacy, which mm-hmm. is the first step in True. spirituality, is to have an intimate relationship with God. And so in Western culture, religion or spirituality is not cultivated to have an intimate relationship with God. It's used to punish mm-hmm. and control, to control, control to punish, That's patriarchy. Yeah, to shame yeah. and condemn. And it's outcome oriented. Absolutely. So True. you do these things, these things, and these yeah. things, and you'll be blessed. And so mm-hmm. when we don't cultivate spirituality in a way that makes us dig deeper so that we can access our higher selves to gain a connection with God because we're so indoctrinated with tangible outcomes. And the outcomes that you get from that deeper relationship aren't necessarily tangible. I I say that to say that that shifted everything for me. And the example that I always give is I used to be so numbers driven with this podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like we had 50 listens, now we get 100, but we need 300. Mm -hmm. We only got this many people following Mm us. We not live on Twitter. And that got me jaded in Mm -hmm. terms of the impact that we do. And what I realized is that Mm -hmm. the numbers are an illusion of your success Mm -hmm. because I can have a million followers, but no one is talking back to me. Yeah. They're a white metric. Yeah. Yes. Numbers are a white metric and we don't measure things in terms of numbers. We measure them in terms of feeling. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so what's real is the engagement yeah. because the engagement is about connection. It's about it's relationship. About relationship. Yeah. What's real is not how many people follow us. It's about how many people have something to yeah. say, how mm-hmm. many people want to talk with us and to connect with us. And mm-hmm. so when you make that spiritual shift of spirituality for me is not about control. It's not about condemnation. Cheater. It's not about shame. It's not tangible outcome oriented. Spirituality for me is about digging deeper yeah. so I can access my higher self so I can connect with God and I can connect with other people. You begin to be mm-hmm. rooted in something totally different and then you can actually make real things yeah I, I feel like right. that I feel like this is somebody out there listening to us is, is fi- trying to figure out how this uh, might look in their lives and I, I want to talk about mm-hmm. your work That's a great- the thing the thing you've been working really hard at kind of trying to hit numbers and trying to make a certain dollar and trying to um, acquire mm-hmm. more things mm-hmm. and the focus mm-hmm. should be on building relationships and mm-hmm. when you're giving them it's- your whole nine you help it yes and i think that's really important because i think the pushback on a conversation like this is often like but poverty is real yeah systemic and institutional oppression is real so you're telling me all this but where does all of that fit in when we're talking about this shift we're talking about shifting from the tangible to the intrinsic we are talking about a practice that doesn't give you necessarily immediate outcomes it starts to give you access to parts of yourself The parts mm-hmm. of your ancestry, the parts of your bloodline, the parts of your spiritual mm-hmm. line, to your gifts, to your abilities. It starts to expand you and awaken you. And when that starts happening, the way you look at the world and how you can move it, how you can shift it, where that power comes from, completely changes. And so that includes systems. And and how we know is because there are some people who are poor but didn't know. Yeah. Me, yeah. I have a poem that says... Yeah. I never felt poor. We yeah. was broke as a joke. And let me tell you how powerful this mindset is. I did not know that we were poor until I was in high school and we had to fill out a form about how much our parents made. And it broke yeah. the form down into class. Mm-hmm. I went home and I asked my mom, I was like, how much money do you make? And she was like, yearly? And I was like, yeah. And she told me and I was like, what? oh my God, it says we're poor. Yeah. You didn't know because of the quality 
of relationship yeah. and the quality of engagement. We have to remember if we were in a space designed by us and for us, then a lot of things that we spend energy feeling like we're missing yeah. out on or gathering now, we would we would not be doing that. I'm gonna say this again because I think people say greater is he who is in me than he is who in the world. We hear that God is in us, but we do not believe or walk around like God is in us. When I say we are shrines, yeah, yeah. I am I'm not about to shout, about to run around the room. I'm about I to run around the room. Anything sacrilegious. I'm not saying anything that your Bible did not say. The mm. difference is the Bible says it, but the practice does not support it. The practice wants you to continue to go to a building, to people outside of yourself to validate your spiritual relationship. And so when you are the shrine, when you have the shrine in your home, when you are the shrine, you carry the shrine and you are that wherever you go. So my biggest frustration with Christianity is the rewriting of Jesus. Mm, say that. If this is, this is my brother, I am a child of God. This is my brother. Because the Bible says you were adopted right. into the family of Jesus Christ. If God created me and God created my brother and, and my brother came to show me how to live and my brother said to me, Mm-hmm. Say you it. Will say do it. Greater, greater work. works than me. Because wait, this 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 is an important part. This is an important part. Because I'm going to my father's house. Because y'all have worn me out. That's what I was about to say. If we really look at the story of Jesus, what we actually see is a tale of frustration. The man <laughs> tried you. on Thank multiple you. occasions to tell these folks, heal your damn self, no. heal your own water into wine. Act Access the God in you. I am your brother. I'm literally just here to show you that it's possible. And y'all niggas are following me from town to town. I get on a boat. You coming out to the sea. I go to the desert. I can't go to the garden. I get everywhere I go. Here y'all are begging when I'm literally telling you constantly that you can do these things and you will do greater works. Let me say this. Listener, if this Listener. feels uncomfortable to you, ask yourself why. Why? Ask yourself why? why. What have you been taught about God? What have you been yes. taught about Jesus? What have you been taught about your relationship, your position in relation to him? And who benefited? Who benefited from that perspective? Who benefited from Come that on. bent? on the message think because about he it told you if you believe the bible is the true word of god and jesus said these things himself i have no idea why you were letting other people convince you something other than what your teacher told you your teacher said that all these things were possible so what we're talking about is spiritual immaturity then right you're not growing. You're not maturing into your spiritual self because you're still running mm. behind me like a child about the mm. things I've shown you how to do. Listen, I've never been more Christ-like than when I started practicing e Yes. Ooh, that's, that's gonna free real. somebody. In my practice, we don't convert. Mm -hmm. I'm just sharing the revelations because listen, if you follow Jesus, I want you to follow mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. I want you to follow Jesus, but I need you to ask yourself, is the mechanism that you're in mm -hmm. really preparing you and allowing you to follow Jesus? Because look at what Jesus had to do. And this is the spiritual work you're in right now preparing you to do that. You thought you got to bring something to yourself. It is really an evolution on a cellular level, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like you just come here and I hand things out to you. It's like, this is relationship. This is conversation this is communication this is learning this is growing. And it's, it's this really is learning because it's an oral practice yes so you can't just bulldoze through the practice you literally have to connect with other people in order to learn and discover and grow more and more within the practice. You all have both mentioned uh, my relationship with food and how that has shifted over the, since that last podcast. So mm -hmm. I'll tell the people what we're talking about a little bit. So here's what happened. I read a book called The Obesity Code by Jason Funk, I don't know, a year ago maybe. And it's a really thick, like academic book. It really is just reviewing all the studies that have been done on weight loss in this country and beyond for probably a century. What the outcome of it for me was really assessing my relationship with food and adopting a lifestyle of fasting, a way of eating that included fasting. And for me, it allowed me to have two days a week was what worked for me, two days a week where I completely set aside 
my uh, desire for food, if you will. I'm really just focused on stillness and quietness and allowing my body to rest and heal from from digestion that had been happening the other five days of the week. And it was transformational for us. We adopted it as a family. We fast together two days a week. Oh, I love it. We break fast together through prayer and just thinking through how the day went for us together communally as a family. And so it's a beautiful thing. Through that, so much of my body was healed. All my blood tests showed better health than I've ever been in my life. Although I wasn't going for that. I was kind of trying to lose weight. <laughs> you know, I went into it. But all of that I went to it, you know, like, damn, you know, maybe this will be the, the thing that works, the thing that sticks. And it really was really eye-opening for us. And, and we learned so much. We continue to learn so much. And um, a lot of aligning, aligning my nails, my hair, everything, which has helped my skin, mm. everything mm. from allowing the really? body to rest, rest from digestion and heal mm. itself. It heals itself. If you give it a break from stuff and stuff in it. <laughs> I definitely need yeah. to, I need to do this more consciously, more intentionally. Yeah. So I'm going to get with you on this for sure. For sure. I, th- I feel like it's better to the earth. It's better to me. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, it, it's spiritual. Yeah. It's it spiritual. is. I can attest to that. So what happened with me was I was hating my body. After the show, I was like, if I'm going to be rooted in freedom, I got to be free in this being. Mm -hmm. And I was like, if nothing else changes about my body, I have to accept this body. And so I went through a period of accepting my body and really trying to heal it, which led me to have the fibroid surgery. It's like, why are you walking around Mm -hmm. with these tumors in Mm -hmm. your body Mm -hmm. that make you crave food and Mm -hmm. sugar and all these other Mm -hmm. things. And there are different methods that you can Mm -hmm. take. Some people take, you know, a more naturopath method and I don't knock that, but I felt surgery was best for me. Right after the surgery, I drank a green smoothie because I I wanted to give my body some, like you said, rest and some some healing and some earth. And when I tell you confronting those fibroids changed my energy level, Mm -hmm changed my skin, regulated my moods. My mood swings were so heavy. And it's because all the things that fibroids are making your body crave. My sugar cravings were like cut in half. And so then I had to like start doing things to say, what do I want to do to heal my body? And that's where intermittent fasting came in because I felt like I was continuously making my body work by making my body digest food. Mm. And what happened through intermittent fasting was my diet began to center on water. Mm. Mm -hmm. So now I don't track what I eat. What I do track is your water. How much water I drink a day. Mm -hmm. I drink at least a hundred ounces to a gallon of water a day. And intermittent fasting forces you to do that because you Mm -hmm. have to put something into your body and you'll be surprised how much your body cannot just live off of, but thrive yeah, off yeah. water. Yes. And if you're drinking that much water, I can't eat nearly as much. Yeah. And so that's sort of how it's changed for me. And in terms of family, they follow my behavior. Like yeah. the last meal is a 745 snack. Yeah. So we really have begun to be a water oriented family. Yeah. I don't buy juice. Yeah. I don't no, make Tea. Yeah. And y'all know that South Sweet Tea. Yeah. I, just for my California listeners, that shit is another level. Yeah. It should come with a shot of insulin. It's three cups of sugar or it's three. not real. What the hell, South Sweet Tea? You know what size is your picture? Three cups. You know it's three cups of sugar. I'm not co-signing the drinkage of three cups I haven't of sugar. physically, yeah. visually seen three cups of sugar since I stopped drinking Kool-Aid. <laughs> I have not physically seen that much sugar in a cup since I stopped making Kool-Aid. Bag me up on this, people. Let us know. How Let us Crystal, Let my us sweet tea tastes like diabetes in a glass, and it don't have three cups of sugar in it. I don't know what. How many cups of sugar do you use? Two. Maybe my picture's smaller than yours. We're going to have to Your talk picture about is this. probably smaller. No, Crystal's picture's probably smaller with more sugar. <laughs> <laughs> three cups. I would say the thing about food overall, I think that it does, it's one We have a very abusive colonizing relationship with food. We don't use it for nutritional value. We use it for emotional coping. The thing about food is food can really help you hone a lot of spiritual gifts. I think before what I was honing was discipline, like really teaching me to discipline myself and be consistent. And now what I'm using it for is to build my intuition and awareness. And so 
really like paying attention to why I want what I want when I want it, if I need it, and ask myself very intuitive questions. And, and like saying, like, today this feels okay to eat, but no, this doesn't feel okay to eat. And like making myself very mindful. Um, like at my job, we know after two o'clock, we start scavenging. Folks start looking for snacks. Why? We've been in these offices all day. We've been listening to a lot of people's trauma and it's emotional. We already know. So knowing that at that time of day, I'm going to emotionally crave something has made me put healthier things in my yes. space. It is a comfort for me because of the work that I'm doing at that time. I'm doing therapy all yeah. day. But so I don't want to deprive myself of the comfort. I also can use that strategically to give myself then the nutrients. So here's the other thing. Food was never meant to be locked up and locked away. Water was never meant to be stored and locked away. And this is how they get us to tap dance nine to 12 hours. And this is why the delivery man was mad at the beginning of Uh-oh. this podcast. Bring it full circle, sis. Bring it back. <laughs> because what we know is that that shit was all free. A gift from God. All the medicine, all the nutrients. It was a gift from God. And the locking it away to make me dance for what was freely mm-hmm. mine mm-hmm. or freely accessible to me as long as I didn't abuse it, which I didn't feel the need to abuse it when mm-hmm. I knew it was readily abundant Ooh. and available. But what you have created is a culture and a, and a need now for me to hoard it and to feel like I may not get it again because you've locked it away. Right. The book Ishmael by Daniel Quinn talks about this. And food is a part of the colonizing. And it's the way of maintaining a labor force. When you free yourself, from food addictions, when you grow your own food, you begin to feel like I don't have to depend on them to supply my food, which also lends yourself to thinking, uh, if you're that uh, delivery man, I can start my own delivery. That's it. That's it. (laughs) Free your food, free your mind. Free your food, free your mind. Full Because I'm still still praying for that brother. I'm I'm still here with that brother. So how has your spiritual practice impacted your motherhood and also what are you rooted in now because I know in episode four we talked about what we were going to root ourselves in so has what you are rooted in changed I don't believe I'm rooted in fear any longer I Mm -hmm. think I am being intentional about creating spaces and environments and situations where I have enough agency that fear is not uh, as powerful, mm-hmm. a force, right? So I have the opportunity to make some decisions here and be in a little bit of control and have say so in the uh, exposures I have to, to potential harm. And so that helped to get rid of fear. I also put a little um, affirmation on my mirror that says, I, I will not fear. Mm. Mm. I say that quite a bit. And so it's helping me to shift from that place. Today, where am I rooted? Oh, that's a good one. Or where do you want to be rooted? Mm. Because we yeah. would just manifest it. Mm-hmm. And so even if you don't know where you're, what you're rooted in, what would you like to be rooted in? Yeah. So I think I've been uh, spending some time becoming more rooted in freedom. I think I have a, I'm on the, a journey there and I think I have a ways to go, but I have certainly shared a whole lot of concern about what folks think about a lot of things, about what I say here on the show, <laughs> about the potential repercussions of what is said here about, you know, being really transparent in a way that's new for me. And that mm-hmm. for me has been really powerful. You have been more open. Thank you, girl. But it's a process and I'm continuing to get better in that space. But as I grow to be more rooted in freedom, my children will become more free. And that to mm-hmm. me is the goal. Mm-hmm. That to me is the goal. And I see places in their lives where they are not free. And I feel like I have an opportunity here to model what it looks like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and to help them get to that place. God forbid they get to live to 40 and don't know what it's, what it feels like to be totally free. To be free. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That makes sense to go yeah. from fear to freedom. To freedom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For me, I would say um, I'm more deeply rooted in joy. Mm. So that was my intention. Then it's just grown deeper. You are. During my one hand, that came up so much. The answer to everything in my life was create joy. I mean, literally worried about your children. Just make it joyful. Don't badger them. Don't go fighting with them. Just think about creating joy. You worried about your work? Just create joy. Like it was the answer to like everything. It kept coming up, kept coming up. And it made sense based on how my teacher ended up structuring my ritual that it created so much joy. It's like I've been feeding off of that for some time. So I think what, I, what I'm working on in my practice is that if I prioritize my joy, not just me producing and creating and giving joy. But if I prioritize, am I doing things because I enjoy them? 
mm-hmm. then I will have an endless supply of one. That's the type of shrine where Yah wants me to be, which mm-hmm. makes sense because again, transformation, destruction, dismantling, it can be joyful. Like it, mm-hmm. when I pull back these layers for people about decolonization and pleasure and the relationship between these things, I see a new type of light in their faces. Mm-hmm. That is joy, you know? And so it's definitely impacted my parenting because when I don't know how to respond or I'm going to respond in a, a typical way, I have to ask myself, could joy solve this problem, right? Could, I'm approaching this like, do this this way, do this this way. But I could just say, let's lighten this up. Let's, you know, let's enjoy this. How can we enjoy this space? How, I can just reframe it. The other thing is one of my children, the youngest one in particular, like she's been drawn to this practice from the very beginning. And it's become more and more clear that she's actually going to walk in the practice and mm. all to walk yeah. in the practice. And she's, she's, over the moon about that. The other two, I'm letting them figure out their way, but I notice little things. Like I notice them lighting my candles or I notice them offering to take care of my shrine or lighting the incense or like we do an offering every five days and you touch everyone with the, the nut you're going to use for the offering. And like, they don't give me any pushback or I openly do my prayer. I openly do my chant. I think where I was before was it was very because of the shame around Afro spirituality, yeah. I think I hid my practice even in my home. I just kind of did it to myself and I didn't feel secure to answer questions. I mean, I think sometimes I even would feel insecure if I came into people who were from Africa. Yes. If they would question what I was doing or was I doing it right or whatever. And I'm and just really, going to leave that alone. If really going to Panama but help me understand my ancestral birthright. No one can tell me what's mine. Mm. You know, no one mm. can tell me what's mine. And so now I'm a lot more visible, which I think helps them to become a lot more visible. So if something's happening and I'm like, oh, that's Oshun or that's Oya, or I'm pointed out and they're like, which one is that again? And so they're learning it their own way because again, I'm integrating spirit into everything. Mm. So I'm pointing out to them that spirit is in everything. Even if they don't know that that is the Ifa right? They're engaging in eco-womanism, which is to me a derivative, a political term for what I'm doing in Mm -hmm. Iba. And so I see that. And I see that in them. I see them trying to then think from a joyful place. It's still a struggle, but I see them at least incorporating it into their mindset and beginning to revere things as though spirit is in everything, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that could ever be a bad thing to know. Yeah. So for me, I was rooted in freedom and I think I have really embraced that. And this coincides with how it's impacted me and my family so much so that um, I now have an altar in my home. Mm -hmm. And so there's just a lot more intention in my practice and where that's helped my family is we were going through this thing where I was holding on to this notion that Q baby should be the spiritual head of our family based Mm -hmm. on Christianity. And so I would criticize him like, well, you're not doing this. You're supposed to be spiritual head. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. And I was praying, I was meditating one day and like a vision of the black church came to me and I kept thinking about it. And it was, it's predominantly women, 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 black women control the black church. So why are you asking him to do this thing Mm -hmm. that you're going to criticize anyway? (laughs) Real talk. Because you know more about it. Mm -hmm. You do more studying about Mm -hmm. it. You know how to guide it better. Mm -hmm. Why are you holding on to the notion that Mm -hmm. he should do this. And I was only holding on to the notion out of colonization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was like, but you're rooted in freedom, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I became the spiritual head of my house. Mm -hmm. Saying this on a podcast is freeing in itself because that's not how people think that it was supposed to be. But especially after reading Jesus and the Disinherited and Howard Thurman breaks down the books of the Bible written by Paul Mm -hmm. and why his grandmother who was enslaved would not allow him to read from those books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Those books of the Bible talk about how the church is supposed to be built and all this. And she felt that those were the books of the Bible that the slave owners allowed them to hear to keep them in control. And see, this is what you have to know. You have to know who wrote the books of the Bible because that gives you a lens. Mm -hmm. The Bible is a historical, political and spiritual manifesto. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to 
to look at it through all of those lens. Yes, so that's where yes, being yes. rooted in freedom landed me. And it's allowed my children to have a deeper practice and my husband and I to have mm-hmm. a deeper uh, spiritual connection mm-hmm. and practice. And so now I'm rooted in abundance. Woo. Let me tell you something. Oh, I love that. I'm just, I I'm just that. thinking about when we listen back to this episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the reason that I am rooted in abundance is because after listening to the episode, what's coming up for me is not enoughness. Mm-hmm. When I look at money, I don't have enough. I'm mm-hmm. not being enough as a mother. I'm not giving enough mm-hmm. to my children. Mm-hmm. I'm not working enough. I'm not working hard enough. And so I said, if a, not enoughness is coming mm-hmm. up for me, what is the opposite of that? What, what is it that, that I need? What is it that I need to manifest? And what I need mm-hmm. to manifest is abundance. Mm-hmm. And I'm not talking about wealth. Abundance. Right. I'm talking about abundance. And the difference for me between wealth and abundance is abundance is rooted in a collective intention. Mm. Because with wealth, I can go out and try to make more money. But with abundance, what I want to do is how do I use my gifts to impact other people and make a sustainable lifestyle for me as well. I'm really, really rooted in that in all aspects of my life, like an abundance in energy, which means what am I putting in my body sure. that can manifest that can manifest abundance? Abundance in engagement. What am I doing in my work practice that can manifest engagement? Abundance in love, ab- abundance in in intimacy and abundance in yeah. money. How am I maximizing my gifts? Am I truly, truly maximizing my gift? And the intention is very important because like I said, you can acquire money. You can acquire all these other things and still not be happy. I think we see that all the time with people who they have all this money and we're like, why are they not happy? And it's like, what was their intention? Mm -hmm. What was their intention behind? I think of Kyrie Irving, who is a basketball player and how he left the Cleveland Cavaliers and he wanted his own team and he wanted to make all this money and didn't like being on a team with LeBron James because, you know, LeBron got all the attention and now he is miserable. He got all the things he wanted, but his intention was rooted in ego. Mm -hmm. And greed. Mm -hmm. And when your intention is rooted in ego, I feel like it breeds this unreal competition Mm -hmm. because if you're rooted in ego, you're never going to be enough. You're never going to have enough. So the intention for me and calling it abundance is very, very important. And it's also an issue of worth for me. Like I, I, I couldn't see an abundant life for myself. Like I literally couldn't visualize it. I could visualize freedom, but I couldn't visualize abundance, having enough to share with people. And I thought, why is that? And it's an issue of feeling not enough and not worthy. And so my prayer to myself and to my Ori Mm -hmm. every morning is root me in abundance, abundance. Show me how to manifest abundance on every single layer of my being. Beautiful. Joy, abundance, and freedom. Yeah. It ain't bad, honey. It ain't bad. It ain't bad. It ain't bad. It's a beautiful thing. I can't wait to circle back here and and see where we are. I can't wait either. That's going to be crazy. I can't wait to listen to this episode. (laughs) So, I guess, I mean, how do you wrap this up? I mean, we could go on and on all day, but the reality is the reason we're this vulnerable and this open with sharing this with you all is because that's how we roll, period. But also, and we free um, and grown, but also because as we, expand and challenge ourselves we want you to feel free and give yourself permission to do the same what we share is our experience and it's blowing our mind as we go Mm -hmm. (laughs) and take what works for you and leave the rest because it's at the end of the day this journey is unique to each individual I don't know what your destiny is I know you have one I know you have one and so how your food practices, what your spiritual practices, mm-hmm. all of that will be tailored to you and your particular destiny. But it is worth investing the time and energy and knowing and figuring out what that is for you, which may be different than the three of us. But we just say, start the journey and and keep walking in that direction. And you will begin to find these things open up for yourself and um, that you'll feel closer to what you're supposed to do, more rooted in who you are. And we wish you nothing but joy freedom and And abundance abundance. Ah!
I love that. Okay, so we are now going to transition into our collection plate cause. Collection plate causes are causes, organizations, initiatives, art projects we feel deserve to be amplified and are worthy of your time, attention, and yes, sometimes money. If you can't donate, we ask that you pass the collection plate by sharing information about our collection plate cause on social media using the hashtag collection plate cause. And this episode's collection plate cause is the Afaya Center, which was established in response to the increasing dis disparities between HIV incidences worldwide and the extraordinary prevalence of HIV among Black women and girls in Texas. TAC, as it's often referred to, is unique in that it is the only reproductive justice organization in North Texas founded and directed by... Black, black women. Black women. Their mission is to serve Black women and girls by transforming their relationship with their sexual and reproductive health through addressing the consequences of reproduction oppression. You can find out more information about them online at the afiacenter.org. That's A F I Y A center.org. And on Facebook and IG at the Afia Center. And on Twitter at, oh, Twitter, <laughs> at the Afaya CTR, which is short for center. Please support them. And if you can't, please share information about them using the hashtag collection plate cause. And if you have a collection plate cause in mind that you feel needs to be amplified, send us the information. We're specifically looking for artistic events, organizations, causes that focus on Black women and dismantling systemic and institutional oppression, the AFIA Center. That's our collection plate cause for this episode. Nice. All right. Well, then it's time for Black Mama Say. Our final segment is where we put a twist on sayings from Black Mamas. This episode's Black Mama Say is, <laughs> the truth is, Crystal? The tr Crystal, what's the tr truth? Truth is. Really, you can take off the duck because it's like truth, truth is. is. Truth is. Truth Just is. Tell us what the Ooh, truth is. Fantasia had a song. Truth, truth, is. truth is. I never got over <laughs> Truth is. You know what? Listen, is. I can't. I can't talk about Fantasia. I can't. <laughs> because you know, I, know you I am her. a Fantasia I know. stand. I know. I you stand for Fantasia. I, I stand for Fantasia. <laughs> Anybody know, that will fuck up a hairdo <laughs> for a single song gets nothing Shoes but off. love. From oh, she me. goes all the way in, Annie. When she sang to Patty that time, and then bangs fell. <laughs> and with, with Fantasia, she just can't take it because that bottom lip starts to tremble. You can watch it in all her performances. That bottom lip starts to shake. And you're like, oh shit, bitch. It's about to go down. Them bangs fell, and she said, and she blew them bangs up. And kept that was it. That's all you needed. Bitch, I was done. I was done. I stand for Fantasia, y'all. I don't give a fuck how much love she should go through in her life. So I'm going to be right funny. here. So if anybody know Fantasia, we can get you a shirt, boo. If anybody know Fantasia, we can get Fantasia you a shirt. Fantasia and Lala, the offer yeah, still Yeah, Fantasia stands. and Lala. So my The Truth Is is, truth is, Jada Pinkett Smith. Mm. I think our truth is uh, overlaps, but go ahead. Is the realest G- conductor of Jedi mind tricks oh, I have yes. ever witnessed in my life. Jada said, what you not gonna do is take this black girl that we know that we know and love and crucify her. A lot of people had a lot of issue with Jada bringing her to the red table talk. And I don't always agree with everything that Jada says at the red table. I usually agree with Grammy, but what I do agree with is Jada said, she not pointed out Yala. She said, not, not, on, not, my on, my not on my watch. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. Not today. No. Not with someone who I claim as she a She put the full power of the Smith family behind that. She did. And that was a black mama moment for mm -hmm. me. Because that's what black mamas do. Even if you think it's a mess, even if you don't think it's worthy, even if they feel like their baby was wrong, what you not going to do, though, is crucify my baby on my watch. And at first, I had sort of an issue with the way that she did it because it really centered on Jordan. Yes. And I felt like she didn't hold 
the Kardashians accountable in any way. But the thing that I loved about that, this was the Jedi Jedi mind trick, Mm -hmm. was by centering on Jordan and allowing Jordan to tell her story from a very humble place. Because when Jada sat down, she was like, you can only control you and what you do. So we're not going to talk about a judge of the people. Mm -hmm. By doing that, that really allowed us to see this child as human. Mm -hmm. Willow didn't learn the difference between racism and discrimination, but well, if Willow's ever in a scandal. We know. And I appreciated the fact that they didn't run away from the fact that Black women Mm -hmm. are crucified crucified that way. Mm -hmm. And Jordan said something very powerful. She was like, I seen it, but I really Mm -hmm. didn't know it. Or I Mm -hmm. knew it, but I really didn't know it. But now I know it. And so I really appreciate that they let that moment live. Yeah. Because that's really what that was about. So that that overlaps with my truth is, because my truth is was going to be, and is going to be, truth is, if I'm ever in a scandal, Mm -hmm. and as spiritual as I am, a bitch could end up in a scandal. <laughs> okay, okay. I don't know where this is going, but I'm with you. Because even after all my logic and my theory, <laughs> right? I, I, even after, it's true. I would Jada to bring you to the red table. You want to be on the red table? I, I'm saying it right now. If I'm ever in a scandal. <laughs> because let me tell you, bitch. Some shit isn't a scandal, but it looks like a scandal. Yeah. Or some shit, like by the time it gets right. out there, it becomes it a thing and it right. really wasn't Which that. Is really it really how I felt like that Jordan thing was. Yeah. Exactly. It was a it was a it was a mm, poor it was poor judgment, but it wasn't malicious. Yes. And I don't even know if it was poor judgment, but we could talk about that another time because what truth is, what people didn't catch is she said, We went to Tristan's house. How you with Chloe, you got your own crib. Then but don't nobody want to talk together. about that. I left them alone when she named that baby true. I mean, because I said, "Oh, this is delusional." <laughs> the baby should have been named lie. The baby should have been named not accuracy that. is important, <laughs> <laughs> and you can call her aim for sh- you can you can call her a nickname. I mean, it should have just been something more reflective. Uh, but 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 if a bitch is in a scam. <laughs> Get Auntie Jada on the line. We got you, girl. I'm asking the DBM community to lobby on my behalf <laughs> for Jada to bring a bitch. Somebody out here got to know how to reach Jada. Bring a bitch to the red table. To the red table. The to upper the table. room. We don't have the upper room. We got the red table. I need y'all to get Jada to me so I can be like, Jada, let me tell you how it really went. Down. And the truth is, from now on, I got another one. And the truth is, from now on, I want Gail King Listen, to interview every that's black really man it. that's ever accused that's of something. That's the truth, right there. The, I, <laughs> yes. Because yes. Let me tell you what a black man don't like. A calm black woman. A calm black woman. A calm woman. black woman. They love to get you up in your feelings and yank at every fucking organ you got. But when you don't give them shit, <laughs> <laughs> and so the way Gail handled that shit, they like for you to get mad to show you care. That's the problem. This is this we got some internal shit in the black community. Yeah. 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 So I, I shouldn't yeah. have gone last on this one. I should not have because I'm bringing because it's not going to be positive. So, and y'all, you know, y'all's was funny, <laughs> but I feel like we need an intervention. Black women need an intervention. We need some help. I don't know what need to pour breast milk on the whole nation. I don't know what the hell's going on. Fix, fix it, Jesus. Just, fix it. Make it rain. Fix it, Jesus. Why in the hell did a black woman bail Robert Sylvester Kelly out of jail? Oh, oh. Was she black? I didn't know. I didn't want to look it at was my black girl. Black mama, a black mama who used her settlement from a wrongful death suit where her child died to bail this Negro out of jail. Truth is, we do some stupid shit. You know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to blame this on white people. So, <laughs> take it. Take it away. I'm, take it away. I'm blaming this on white people. Okay. And I'm just going to walk away from it. You're just going to say it's white people's fault and you're not going to explain why. I feel why. like that's enough of an answer. I feel like that's, that's complete. I'm sure if I worked on it, I you could the connection. Let me tell you why you don't have to explain. White people have yet to explain save slavery. So I don't have to explain this shit. So I feel like we can say that's on white people, white people and not explain nothing. She did it because of white people. I don't know. That's all I can say. Nikisha, your truth is, truth is, a black woman bailed out R. Kelly because of white people. That's her chapter. I mean, this makes sense to me. That's all I got. There you go. 
See how you brought it back around, Nikisha? You brought it back around. But, you know, I will say Black women are not monolithic on this. And Black women have been policing other Black women. It's other true. Black women. Black women have led the Mute R. Kelly. They, they led the, the Mute R. Kelly movement for sure. We are not, you know, homogenous. We're not monolithic in this. Right. Some of us are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and we're dumb because of We're going to blame it on the patriarchy, on white people. Okay, that'll work. Anyway, that's all we got. That's literally, I can't. That's all I got. Anytime anything comes up that's really like disturbing or confusing about black people, I'm just gonna be like, yeah, I mean, look what y'all did. Look what y'all did. So that's it. Please, like we said, go in the upper room, intercessory prayer, keep us on your prayer list for all the uh, things we said. Some folks gonna really be praying for us now. Hold us up. Hold us up. At the beginning of the episode, um, Nikisha. Oh, thanks. Appreciate that. Um, yeah. Follow. It's, it's the same order every time. Same order. Same. Follow us on. What kind of shade is that? That's kind of. I'm that just crystal to shade, shade to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That was the type of shade too. I caught it. It is a type of shade. I don't know what it is yet, but we gonna write this book. I we maybe we call it Southern it. Shade Dedication. Is it Southern Shade? Southern Shade. It could be a little bit. What is that you're listening to while we're trying to close out the show? Fantasia. <laughs> <laughs> Truth is, Crystal can throw shade too. I never got over you. That's all I'm gonna say. It is true. That's Black Mama said. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Dim Black Mamas. And don't forget to check out our website. You can also send us your thoughts about the show. Show us some love and ask us some questions at dimblackmamas at gmail.com. Yes, please write us. We love your emails because that's engagement. Please uh, comment on our post. That's engagement. And we want this to be a conversation, a dialogue. Dim Black Mamas is not a presentation. We want it to be a conversation and a dialogue. Um, or if you have topics suggestions or you want to know more about us please shoot us an email and that's our show that's all we got we We ain't got no more more. wish you joy freedom and and abundance that's a good show people that's a deep one